Hi everyone, James here. Now, as you will have noticed the last few weeks, it is holiday season for us, mostly because we have a brand new, massive, stonking UK and Ireland tour just about to happen, and we need to get as much rest as we can before that happens. By the way, you can get tickets for that by going to qi.com slash fish events. But anyway, what do we have for you this week? Well, we have another compilation. The last one went down so well. You all sent loads of really nice messages about how much you enjoyed it. So it's another hour of us being so silly. These are the times when everything got derailed a little bit too much, so we couldn't fit it into the actual show. But I always gather them together because they're always so much fun, and I put them in a nice little package for you guys. We will be back again next week with a normal episode. It was recorded while I was away, actually it's another super special guest one that i particularly i'm quite upset that i wasn't there for because it's a really good friend of ours someone who's incredibly interesting and funny i'm actually really really looking forward to listening to that one myself because i haven't heard it yet but anyway for the meantime please do enjoy this compilation and we'll see you as a foursome on the road or on this podcast feed very very soon okay on with the podcast uh, do you guys know um soldier boy soldier boy tell him you guys know he's a uh, he's come on guys no he's a rapper go, no. he's a rapper okay uh, yeah. he's got a song called kiss me through the phone which gives a phone number um halfway through it and um, a load of people decided to call it, and it turns out to be a house in Oldham. <laughs> 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 Who, um, according to The Guardian, were getting a load of um, crank calls. Um, but I don't need to tell you guys that that's a terrible missed opportunity because one of his main songs is called Crank That. So they, they. So they should have called it Crank Calls. Crank That Calls, yeah, probably. Crank. Okay. Wait, what's... I really <laughs> misjudged my audience with this one. <laughs> Who were you aiming at? That? Was it, Dan? it feels like Dan might have had a prayer. <laughs> Anna hasn't heard anything since Cole Porter. <laughs> uh, Britain's leading female table tennis player is this woman, this girl called Tin Tin Ho. And do you guys, can you guess why she's called that? She's got a quiff, Tin Tin. <sighs> Um, That's why I no. was. I was got a Tintin. small dog called Snowy. Confusingly, it's not related to the character of Tintin. Wait, she hangs out with an old fisherman called kidding. Captain Haddock. Uh, again, it's not like a. <laughs> she thing. has. Um, she has a pair of twins that she hangs out with called the Thompson twins. <laughs> you can't just stop us making Tintin jokes, Anna. Immediately, you got to live. She, with her <laughs> her father is called Hergé. <laughs> right. As I have made quite clear, it's not related to Tintin, and there must be other avenues you can pursue. She's Belgian. You know? Shit, right. Belgian? I'm yeah. just going to tell you, okay? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, um, I feel like we're close. She's made of tin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, he's found something different. But okay. incorrect. No, it's because her dad is obsessed with table tennis. And it actually sounds kind of weird. <laughs> no, like, sorry. Yeah, Hang it's on. Com- it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> I, I, I was so sure you were going to say her dad is obsessed with tin tin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish I hadn't brought this up. <laughs> He's obsessed with table tennis, yeah. and the initials of table tennis are TT, so we call her Tintin. And in fact, her brother is called Ping. And she said there was it was between her being called Tintin and her being called Pong when she was born. Wow. And so she says that she is delighted that she didn't That's get cool. ponged. You can't have two That's kids cool. and call them Ping and Pong. <laughs> the social oh, no, services no. will get involved. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> um, um, here's a stolen dog. Mm-hmm. In 1860, um, during the Second Opium War, the Anglo-French looted and burned the Summer Palace and found five Pekingese dogs um, guarding a corpse of a lady. And so they stole the dogs, and one of them was given to Queen Victoria, who renamed her Looty after oh. all the all the looting that the British were doing wow. in China at the time. Mm. Lol, um, isn't that amazing? That is quite. Open. I would have thought she would name it something like completely legal taking of stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow, uh, uh, P.G. Woodhouse, he collected Pekingese dogs, or he bred them, or he, you know, he had dozens of them. Did he steal them from... He stole all of them from uh, <laughs> China. Yeah, oh, really? that's why his yeah. books have very low sales figures there. It's really interesting that Pekingese, um, like, 
they're quite small, aren't they? But they almost look a bit like a lion because they've got like a mane kind of around their face. Uh, and there are a few myths about where they came from. According to one myth, a lion fell in love with a marmoset and he begged the gods to shrink him in size so that he could have sex with a marmoset. And they did. And that's <laughs> where the Pekingese came from. You think I, it would go the other way around. You'd pray for a massive <laughs> marmoset, yeah. No, I don't... Expand the marmoset, oh God. Actually, <laughs> so I'm that I may shag it. This. <laughs> no, I'd rather um, a tiny lion. I take it back. There's another theory. Uh, this isn't a myth. There's another theory that Buddhist monks, um, like in Buddhism, a lion is a symbol of strength, it's a symbol of wisdom, and they wanted to have dogs that looked like a lion, so they bred Pekingese to look like lions. Uh, Which is true. We might never know. There was a guy who was a stunt flyer back in the very early days of flight called uh, Al Wilson, and he hit golf balls off planes, which is not as impressive as scoring a putt on Concord, except that he was standing on top of the plane at the time. (laughs) So he would climb up onto the top of a biplane and just do amazing drives off it. There are photos of him doing that. How how is the air friction there not knocking the golf ball off the tee? I don't... (laughs) I don't... (laughs) <laughs> Maybe he nailed a tee into the top of the biplane before clambering Yeah, but up. you'd have to nail the ball also onto the tee, which <laughs> yeah. you'd nail yes. onto Maybe the plane. he did that too, and then... <laughs> well, just... then how did he hit it? <laughs> Maybe... <laughs> okay, you I've know, got I've clever this, have you? Yeah, I've it. <laughs> Maybe it was one of those Velcro balls, you know, that you throw at paddles. Maybe he just oh, Velcroed it. Then, yeah, that's real. Mm. You have Thank thought you. about this, haven't that's, you? There you go. <laughs> Except, hang on, he was in the 1920s and Velcro hadn't been invented at the time. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so maybe he is the unrecognized inventor of Velcro and we are giving him his moment of glory. Excellent. Well, Al Wilson, yeah. congratulations. <laughs> um, Gibraltar named after Jebel Al Tariq, um, who oh. was the general who brought the Islamic army from North Africa into Spain uh, when Spain became an Islamic country um, in whenever that was, the 8th century mm-hmm. or whenever it was. Um, But he was in charge of the whole army. They came over, they landed in Gibraltar, they took over most of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, There was him, um, who was Jebel al-Tariq, and there was another guy called Musa, who were in charge, these two generals. Uh, And then, for some reason, in 714, they were both accused of misappropriation of funds, sent back to uh, Damascus, and they both died in complete obscurity. Oh, so they were the ones who brought um, the Islamic invasion into Spain. And for the reason now that, you know, there's a lot of Islamic culture still there, a lot of buildings and stuff. But yeah, they just got kicked out for nicking a load of money. Right. Wow. Right. Yeah. Fittingly, it's known as a little bit of a tax haven now. So I suppose doing him, doing mm. him proud, the money nicker. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the thing about money. It's very Moorish. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah <find> that one. <laughs> Probably one of the most famous fictional minerals in the world mm. is kryptonite. I would argue. Mm. Kryptonite was invented as an idea for being a mm. thing of vulnerability for Superman that would make him really sick. Because when the first radio series happened in America, the actor who played Superman, who obviously had to be there all the time, was desperate to have holidays, and they couldn't (laughs) have holidays because he's the main character. So if in a previous episode, Kryptonite was introduced, like he was hidden behind a door where Kryptonite was holding it closed, the actor, Bud Collier, could go on holiday and not have to be in the episodes. And the rest of the cast would be going... Poor Superman, where's he disappeared to? But we all know yeah, he's, he's behind been, the door. He's been with gagged. He can't it. say anything. Yeah. yeah. How boring were the episodes where Superman wasn't in them? <laughs> what happens in those? Well, is it just everyone going. I, I wonder where he is. Is he better? Have you seen him? Did you give him Lemsip? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Lemsip works against Kryptonite? Oh yeah, it's Lemsip the only works thing. Against everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's so weird how long we went without dissecting human bodies. So we just dis- we. Uh, I, I will claim responsibility. I've as gone an at least Greek. three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so the first known dissections in the West, at least, were Herophilus and Erasistratus, and this was the third century BC. And so this is quite revolutionary. They thought if we start cutting into human bodies, we can figure out how they work, what the anatomy is. And they died. And it immediately went out of fashion. People said, we don't actually need that. It's totally unnecessary. It's kind of gross. It's ungodly. Then the Christians came along and they totally banned it. 
And we don't really think anyone dissected a human body for science for another 1,600 years Ooh. until about, wow. so about 1231, the Holy Roman Emperor said, actually, we should start doing this and made a decree that medical students had to. And so there was this rush on bodies. And there was such a rush that there was a big old shortage. The demand and supply didn't work out. And so there became a situation where by the 15th century in Italy, medical students had to pay for the funerals of corpses. And that's, that would be their way of saying, look, I'm going to pay you, but you have to give me that corpse afterwards. Right. Wow. So basically wow. you get your funeral expenses paid by a doctor. Yeah. As long as they then cut you open. Yeah, but that's at the end of the funeral thing plop you over their shoulder and walk off with you it doesn't <laughs> <Yeah>. feel <laughs> i don't think they would do that. i think they'd wait for the curtains to go across before they did that God, i don't really think funny. someone's walking in going are you done with that <laughs> <laughs> i paid good money for that <laughs> <laughs> have you guys heard of jacqueline oriol no. no so she was the um, daughter-in-law of the president of france in the um, 1940s after the war and she helped to decorate some of the rooms of the Elysee Palace uh, after the war, and she was known as one of the most elegant women in all of Paris. Mm -hmm. And then in 1948, she thought, fuck this, the Elysee Palace, it's fine, it doesn't need any more work, so she decided to become an aerobatic pilot, and she um, got into a massive crash and crashed into the Seine, and she had to have 22 operations to rebuild her face. Wow. That was how bad the, um, the crash was. But then in 1953, she became one of the first ever test pilots to fly Concorde, and she was the first woman to fly Concorde. Mm. Really? Wow. Yeah, imagine that for a CV, to go from like interior design in the palace <laughs> yeah. in, in Paris and then to that. Yeah, yeah that is incredible. Cool. Yeah. But no one would believe you were the same person because you've got the rebuilt face. <laughs> oh my God, I'm just, that's so right. It's not the same I person, bet. is it? No, <laughs> you've fallen for a really obvious prank. Of is it Con Air where they changed the face of um, Nicolas Cage and stuff? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Is it? Oh, is that Face, face off? off? Face, face off. off. Oh, Face, face off. off, yes. It's a, <laughs> face Off is the same plot as Con Air, isn't it? Apart from the face the coming off. Yeah. off. Yeah. I think Face Off and Con Air, the merging of the two is your story. Your story that's <laughs> right in the middle. <laughs> I just have one more recent dog napping that I liked. Uh, this was a journalist in Boston called Juliana Matza. Did you see her? She was re reporting on a dog that had been stolen in the local area. Kind of slow news day. She's speaking on camera about a missing German shorthead pointer. And she spots a man who matches the photos that have been put out, the CCTV photos of the dog been stolen, with the dog that looks like the dog. So she goes up to him and she said, hey, can I just pet your dog? Checks its collar. It is, lo and behold, the stolen dog. So on camera, you can watch it. It's a very awkward interview. She says, is this your dog? And he's like, um, no, it's not. It's been missing for a day, for 24 hours. And she says, why do you have it? And he says... I walked past a car and it was barking and I thought it was the dog that I was supposed to be walking because I'm a dog walker. So obviously what, it's I, got into a car? I, what? I, yeah. and so Maybe he was tired of walking. <laughs> <laughs> so I broke into the car and I took it. And she said, why didn't you call the number of the person on the dog collar? And he said, oh, I was sort of tried, but my phone broke and then I lost my phone. Um, wow. Simple wow. mistake. This guy's had a horrible day. Well, that's an incredible <laughs> story, Anna. But also... What the hell kind of TV station is doing news video packages about a lost dog within 24 hours? <laughs> it's like I say, slow news day in Boston. <laughs> I should also say the verdict has not been returned on his guilt, I don't think. So jury is out. Okay. Jury's out. Good. Well, good luck to him. Um, <laughs> can we get done for some judiciousness? Definitely. <laughs> I don't think so. Do you know where the American fear of sharks um, throughout the general pop place comes from, where it originated? <sighs> no. It was, so it wasn't Jaws? It was, it was before that? Predates Jaws, for sure. Ooh, okay. Um, Does it originate in the fact that sharks eat people <laughs> in the water? <laughs> <laughs> but they don't tend to eat you if you live in Montana or, you know. Mm. Um, no. Okay. It basically comes we think probably from world war Two. there were lots of stories especially in the newspapers um this did happen that planes would kind of crash in the water and then the sharks would get the get the um people but it didn't happen that often but the newspapers used to report that it was happening all the time 
Um, but nevertheless, the US military needed to come up with a way to stop um, sharks attacking not just people who've crashed, but also munitions. So if you're in a submarine, you need to stop them from coming towards the munitions. So the Office of Strategic Services, which was that kind of um, office, which kind of came up with lots of wacky kind of dick dastardly plans, um, <laughs> they hired someone called Julia Child um, as part of their team to try and work out the chef. The chef, yes. What? Oh. So oh. before she became a chef, she was a person who worked in the war to try and come up with ways to stop sharks from attacking people and munitions. And she tried things like clove oil, horse urine, nicotine, rotten shark, uh, asparagus. She tried all these things to try and stop <laughs> um, sharks from coming near them. And in the end, none of them really worked that well. And so they came up with this thing called Shark Chaser, which was a little pill and you would put it in the water and it would release like a dye into the water so the shark wouldn't be able to see you. So it oh. wouldn't repel it, but it would stop it from being able to find you. That is crazy. Yeah. God, it's awful if you confuse a Julia Child recipe with one of her shark repellents, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? <laughs> well, she's for anyone who doesn't know her, she was the one who basically brought French cuisine to uh, Americans. Um, so oh, um, yeah. she was huge. She famous. was massively famous. She had her own cooking show, didn't she? One of the first people to yeah. do that. She was huge. What a, another really good CV. Cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Amazing CV. Mm. And you're um, sure it wasn't someone with a face transplant, James? <laughs> <laughs> was <it> Nicholas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there is a. Uh, there was a thing in 2012 where Boeing, the plane company fixed their Wi-Fi on their planes using 9,000 kilos of potatoes. Okay. So did they just happen to have so much potatoes on board the flight at the time, or...? Uh, I think they specially got them in. Oh. And they got them in to pretend to be humans because they needed to test the Wi-Fi on their planes and where you get, you know, hot spots and then cold areas and you wanted to fix it all the way through. Um, and it turns out that potatoes block internet signals in much the same way that human bodies do <laughs> and so they got 9,000 kilos of potatoes and just sat them in the seats of the plane and pretended that they were people and um, and tested it that way and they didn't need paying and they didn't need feeding but what? That's this, great This is so That's, weird. They have the same water content as humans like that kind of thing right? Yeah I guess so and they're, they're maybe about as dense as humans. It reminds me of the time when I was on a plane and the Wi-Fi stopped working and I asked them to turn it off and turn it back on again and they said we think this is the button but we've never pressed this button on the plane before. <laughs> <laughs> and I said let me come and have a look at it and I looked and I'm like yeah I'm pretty sure that's the router button. Wow. Sorry they, oh they took God. your <laughs> advice. Yeah. Oh my God. Random dude on the plane. Cool. <laughs> right. That's amazing. <laughs> well, I had my, um, it was the NFL draft for my fantasy football team and I really needed to get on the internet. <laughs> wow. Right. What would, James, that's real confidence in your abilities at identifying a router. What else is it going to be? What a weird place to put the ejector seat. <laughs> <laughs> Or the spontaneous combustion button. Yeah. You never know. All yeah. planes have one. Then they always put it right next to the router. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mark. Table tennis was a big thing in Britain in the sort of early 20th century. I think it was kind of invented in the 1880s, went under, came back in the 1920s and was popularised by this guy, Ivor Montague. Did you read about him? No. 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 He's, that's disappointing because... It's going to be a long section. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh boy. Have you not noticed we've been doing this for eight years now and we always say no. Whenever someone says, have you heard of this person, we always say no. Because right. otherwise it'd be a pretty... Yeah, yeah, we've all done the research. I genuinely haven't though. Yeah. I've no idea about this seminal figure in table tennis. I thought I covered the bases. I haven't, clearly. <laughs> Well, I've a surprise for you, Andy, because Ivor wow. Montague Oof. is the, thank you, <laughs> grandfather of table tennis in Britain. Okay. But he was also a spy. So he's such an amazing character. He founded the English Table Tennis Federation and then he founded the International Table Tennis Federation in 1926. Clever. More spying opportunities and internationally. Nice. Well, you joke, <laughs> but British intelligence was incredibly suspicious of him all the way through the war, World War Two, because of his ping pong habit. Yeah, because he kept thought... standing in airports with two ping pong bats <laughs> in his hands, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, just redirecting planes into the English Channel um, because they thought it was so weird. 
So there's a letter from an MI6 agent who writes to the agent in Bulgaria, basically about all these letters that are being exchanged between Ivan Montagu and these two guys in Bulgaria. And uh, they're sort of discussing like intricate details of the game. They discuss bat weight. They discuss the spin on different balls. And MI6 was convinced this was code. And so he wrote to this agent in Bulgaria and said, look, you've got to investigate these two Bulgarians. He said, the reason for our interest will appear to you rather quaint. But the thing is, they write interminably to Ivan Montagu about table tennis and trying out of table tennis balls. <laughs> so the agent in Bulgaria investigated these guys and replied saying, it seems as though these guys are just perfectly solid individuals who spend their time testing table tennis balls. And, and that Seen was that. that. Wow. Seemed that way. It did. Cover. But the big reveal in the 60s was that he was in fact a Soviet spy. Really? Oh. Yeah, so he was. wait, wait, wait. But were they writing about table tennis balls as well? Do we know that element of the story? It's not clear. We know he loved table tennis. It doesn't seem to have been declassified whether or not this was code. So, wow. I don't know. He was really into the game and a spy. What do you think? What do you think is the world record for slicing the most watermelons in half on your stomach with a sword in 60 seconds? Oh, no, no, no. I know. I know the Queen has this record. I just can't remember the exact number. <laughs> it was a record beaten by friend of the show, Ashrita Furman, who um, his oh, life's work yeah. is just to get as many random Guinness Book of Record things as possible. 60 seconds on your belly with a yeah. sword, slicing, slicing, not allowed slicing wear, them himself. He's slicing them himself. You're not allowed to wear any protection. So you're slicing down on a sword onto your stomach, basically. Yep. 14. Oh, I see. You're lying on yeah. your back. And you're, oh, oh yeah. wow. Um, is someone placing the watermelons or do you have to reach? Um, someone would and grab place them. them onto him each time. Okay. 14 sounds like a very sensible bet for Anna. Thank That's you. quite ambitious. Because you get to 13 and you think, oh my God, I don't want to do the unlucky one. I'm holding a bloody sword. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to get I better slice really, really fast and hard this 14th <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say 23. Oh, come on. Yeah. That's what I said. Oh. This guy's a James. record holder. Yeah, well, Dan is really Put close. It's 26. It's 26. Wow. Uh, and there was an interview with uh, Mr. Furman who said, my first reaction is I'm relieved I didn't kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know what you good. used to do in the 14th century in the Sahara if you got bitten by a snake? Mm. Come on, guys, we've all done the research. We all must know That's, this. <laughs> we know this, yeah. It's so hard faking not knowing any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> What you would do is you would cut the throat of your camel and you would put your hand into the camel's stomach and leave it there for the whole night. And in theory, that would suck out the poison and you would be fine. Um, I learned this from... There was an account of a traveller, a Moroccan traveller called Ibn Battuta. He travelled more than uh, Marco Polo, who went 15... Thousand miles. He went seventy-two thousand miles all the way around the world. He was an amazing traveler. And when they went through the Sahara, this was the trick that they used. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't really work, and the guy had to have his fingers cut off anyway. But um, it was but one worse th- for the camel. Let's face it. It was worse for the camel, definitely. No one comes out of this well, I must say. <laughs> mm. um, apart from possibly Dan, because when I was reading this account, I read <gasps> that when they ran out of water. They would kill an antelope and they would drink water from the entrails of the antelope, which many, many, many years ago, Dan, I think, said on this podcast and we all poo pooed it. But this in the 14th century, this is what this traveler used to do. Vindicated. This is genuinely like five years later. (laughs) We were just doing that thing where we pretended not to know the facts, you know? (laughs) We all knew it was true. One landlord was sacked for selling hay out of the back of the pub. So... There were strict okay. rules. This was Dora, right? This is Dora who did this. The yeah, old, yeah. the old cow, miserable old cow, Dora. Um, the Defence of the Realm Act, which um, had loads of other fun rules as well, as well as all this pub stuff. So you weren't allowed to light bonfires or fireworks or fly a kite. I think in case it was mistaken <laughs> for a bomb. A um, zeppelin. A zeppelin. Yeah. yeah. You weren't allowed to whistle for a taxi in case that was mistaken for an air raid siren. What? Which does... How loud is your whistle? <laughs> People whistled louder back then, famously. Right. If um, you can mistake whistles for air raid sirens, then when the actual air raid siren went off, were a load of taxi drivers driving around looking for these <laughs> yeah. rides the whole time. It, it was absolutely tragic. Yeah. Orange lights going on across London. Yeah. <laughs> All killed. 
The um, Doctor Who theme tune was written by an Australian composer called Ron Grainer, the melody. But actually, the importance of it is the crazy effects, right? Yes. It's this amazing piece of electronic music. Uh, and really, when it was invented, there wasn't really a such thing as electronic music. or There kind of was, but it definitely wasn't popular. It wasn't done much. And the mix was made by a musician called Delia Derbyshire. And she basically took each note of the melody and individually made it by taking a version of it played on some strings and then kind of speeding it up, slowing it down, splicing it with something else. Every single note was put together to come up with this amazing, iconic theme tune. And Delia Derbyshire was brought up in Coventry in 1940, and she said she was inspired to get into music by the sound of the air raid sirens as the Germans were bombing Coventry. Mm. And it was those kind of noises that got her interested in sounds, and that eventually got her interested in music. So... What a what a glass half full kind yeah. of she obviously was. <laughs> That's true. That's so funny. Yeah. I have actually been to a place which has a an annual tooth festival. Oh. Yeah. I th- I think really? I've as well actually. Is it like one of Buddha's teeth? It's the Temple of the Tooth in Kandy in Sri Lanka. Oh. And the town is called Kandy and it is one of the, it's a tooth of the Buddha dating to about 300 AD. You can't really see it when you go there, ah, when you're in the temple, okay. because it's in a casket which contains five progressively smaller caskets. And in the <laughs> smallest casket is the Buddha's tooth. And um, it's an incredible brouhaha every year. I wasn't there at the time of the festival, annoyingly, but there's drumming, music, there's dancing, there's cannon fire, massive great elephants, many with their own biographies on Wikipedia now. The elephants? Parade through. Really? The ele- yeah. Wow. Four of the main elephants, they're called tuskers, you know, they have these great big tusks. Uh, they parade through the streets with the uh, tooth container. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing temple site. It's really fabulous. I've been to another one. I've been to one in Singapore, which is the same. Were you at the incisor or the canine or the molar? <laughs> it was the wisdom. It was the wisdom of the Buddha. <laughs> uh, Very I, nice. My feeling is that that one, and this is so far going off memory that it might be completely wrong, but I think the tooth like really doesn't come, comes out very, very, very rarely, as in... You know, Do you mean the candy the, one? No, the one in in Singapore. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah this one's right. the candy one's all over, it, isn't it? But it must be so confusing for the elephants who are employed to carry this tooth all about town. This tiny tooth, and looking at each other, going, "Have they seen our teeth? Look at them. <laughs> I mean, they're about a meter long." But What's they are. They're celebrated this? for their massive tusks. They are. Oh, they, they are. They, aren't that's they? why. That's why they're recruited for right. the job in Elephant Academy. And the the crazy thing is that this is all in a place called Candy, which is yeah. normally very bad for your teeth. Exactly. But it, I thought that's why they were having the festival. So many teeth were falling out. They thought we got to do something with these. <laughs> <laughs> also, they always invite Rob Becker over to do an opening set, don't they? Because he's got such big teeth. <laughs> he actually carries it through the streets if the elephant's not available. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Esther Ransom for any older listeners. <laughs> Just, I, are we now doing a sort of choose your own podcast? <laughs> yeah, what about the TikTok generation? Who's got big teeth on TikTok? <laughs> right in. Nobody. They've all got perfect teeth. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that formaldehyde can preserve people was discovered by a guy called Ferdinand Blum, uh, B L U M, and he was using formaldehyde as hoping to use it as an antiseptic. And he was kind of putting it on things. And then he noticed that he put it on his fingers and his fingers got really, really hard when he put the formaldehyde on his fingers. So he found it kind of by accident, as I know Mm. that you love that kind of story, Andy. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Did he stop at his fingers once he noticed that they went really, really hard? (laughs) Did he (laughs) proceed anywhere else? I mean, you would, wouldn't you? You, (laughs) If you noticed that putting formaldehyde on your fingers made you go really, really hard, the cock is the obvious next step. It's a short step. <laughs> wow, what a what a world we could have had. Yeah, where that was standard. You just pop and get some formaldehyde. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. Cool. I, d- I don't know if it would have got flown off the shelves. Yeah. Like you're imagining. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't look uh, great if medical students were getting boners as they were dissecting a body. <laughs> <would it? laughs> In Peru, if you go and eat potatoes, mm-hmm. and you go into the top of the Andes, and you go to a potato shop or a little stall. They might give you a little bag of clay to eat with the potato. And you Mm. might put some water in the clay and make it into a little bit of a dip and then dip your potato in it and then eat it because that's like one traditional way to eat potatoes in the Andes. And the reason is that potatoes used to be poisonous 
they come from the same um the same family as like deadly nightshade and stuff don't they and in the early days when they were first domesticated they were still a bit poisonous but if you eat a little bit of clay while you're eating your potato then the clay will attach to these molecules called glycoalkaloids and it will stop your body from processing them which means that they won't become poisonous anymore and so the still today it's a traditional way even though they're not poisonous anymore you might still put your potatoes in a bit of clay that's so clever. Cool. It is really clever. And what's clever about it is how do you learn that, right? How do you decide I'm yeah. going to put my potatoes in clay? And what they think is that humans saw parrots doing it or saw llamas doing it and copied the parrots or the llamas. But hang what? on. That just raises a second question. <laughs> that is so annoying. Exactly. Oh, yeah, we just learned it from the llamas. Well, how did the llamas learn how to yeah. do it? Uh, and how they... did the parrots learn? Yeah. yeah. Animals learn different things to us. That's, you know... But where did the learning start? If we're if we're saying that our learning must have come from watching another animal do it, their learning must have come from watching another animal. And I don't believe the parrot originated it. If anyone's a copier rather than originator, <laughs> the parrot. <laughs> You're right. I did look up if there was a um, George the Fifth potato, and I don't think there is because the King Edward is named after Edward the Seventh specifically. But there are other things named after King Edward. So <laughs> there is Poulard. Edward the Seventh, because he was a big eater, basically, and he was a famous gourmand. So he he had lots of dishes named after him by Crawley chefs. Is uh, that chefs from Crawley? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. He he always tra- he always flew from Gatwick, <laughs> and he made sure to go via Crawley on the way. Um, Pula- Poulard Edward the Seventh is chicken stuffed with foie gras, which yeah, feels yeah. like the most decadent thing I can possibly imagine yeah. eating. Have you guys heard of Christina Zanato? Christina or Christina? Crustacean. <laughs> crab. No, Crust- Christina. Like the. Why would you assume Christina? How many people are Be- you because we're, Christina? Because because we're talking about the ocean, and we were talking about. I thought it might be a crustacean. The normal person's name, Christina. Christina Zanato. Um, she is sometimes called the shark whisperer. Uh, she works in the Bahamas and whenever any shark in the Bahamas gets a hook in its mouth they go and see Christina wow isn't that amazing what the sharks what does, know what how, does... how's, how's the word got out with sharks <laughs> I don't know she put flies up I don't know how what? they know but ages and ages ago there was a shark came up to her and she realised it had a hook in its mouth and so she took it out and now it does seem that whenever any shark, one that she's never met before, gets a hook in its mouth, they somehow know to go to her and get it fixed. They trust but her. Wow. Not, not when she's not when she's in land. No, not when she's in a restaurant no, no. or something. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry, sorry. Um, are, are you crustacean Zanata? <laughs> <laughs> she scuttles away sideways to finish her meal. Um, well, you, so, you never wow, know, there are must... nine species of shark that can walk, so you never know. They could enter that restaurant. Mm, could be. That but... is so cool. But isn't it but weird? What, so she, yeah. she spends loads of time in the water, I guess, and they just... Yeah, she's a diver and a wow. researcher and stuff. She spends a lot of time looking at sharks and looking with sharks, but she just seems to have according to the article i read she seems to have this reputation among sharks as being a person <laughs> they can trust if they get a hook in their mouth Jesus. that's incredible just insane <laughs> oh. i once went to a restaurant in i can't remember where it was now um mauritius maybe i think and um it was a floating restaurant and the sharks would swim around where your tables were and the waiters would wow. throw bits of meat into the water to kind of get them to come up and bite and stuff. And yeah, oh God. <laughs> I would not order the fish there. Order, what do sharks dislike? Yeah. Tofu. Yeah, I'd order tofu. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, speaking of this, there is a story that Isaac Newton and Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet fame. Mm-hmm. Am I saying that Halley, right? I think. But yeah, we, oh, we no, say Halley. But yeah, it is Halley. I think. I thought it was Haley, like Bill Haley and the comets. There we go. Um, well, we've there's got a story. Races. Yeah. <laughs> there's a story that Newton and Halley, Hawley, once dissected. God, this is a nightmare to read out. A dolphin <laughs> in a coffee shop. It's actually a dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> there's a story that they dissected a, dissected a dolphin in a coffee shop called the Grecian Coffee House, and wow. uh, I've traced it back. And maddeningly, I think it's not true. Yeah. So I'm just here to bust this myth wide open. Uh, was it a porpoise? <laughs> it's a, there's a diary of a member of the Royal Society called Thorsby from June 1712 and it says in, and he says in his diary 
Attending the Royal Society where I found Dr. Douglas dissecting a dolphin lately caught in the Thames, where were present the President, Sir Isaac Newton, both the secretaries, the two professors from Oxford, Dr. Halley and Keel, with others, whose company we afterwards enjoyed at the Grecian Coffee House. Okay, so that, to me, implies yep. they dissected the dolphin, then they went for a coffee, rather mm. than dissecting the dolphin at the coffee house, which okay. makes so much more sense. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. the way to yeah, yeah. do They're it. They're not going to let you into Starbucks with a dead dolphin, are they? They're not going to give you a stamp on your card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it still is a remarkable story that those two characters were dissecting a dolphin in yeah. London. I mean, that's yeah. that's pretty cool. That's the sort of yeah. three things I didn't expect to be near each other. So <laughs> yeah. that's sure. quite good. Actually, Virginia Woolf is another one who has a famous plaque situation going on, right? Because she lived in the same house as George Bernard Shaw. So they, it's, I think it's one of the only places with two blue plaques on it hmm. and they realised that Wolf and Shaw their lives collided much later so there's a letter from Virginia Woolf to George Bernard Shaw in 1940 they'd only sort of met a couple of times they'd stayed in the same country house in 1915 and it's so flirty he was in his 80s at the time she was about to commit suicide and he... <laughs> I hear I hear romantic yeah. music yeah. 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 painted the romantic picture he was in his 80s <laughs> She was on the brink of suicide. Well, she sounded um, she sounded in a good mood in the letter. She said to him, you have acted a lover's part in my life for the past 30 years. Wow. Yeah, but presumably his work more than him. But And he'd yeah. already confessed his love to her from, from another letter, saying, wow. I fell in love with you the moment I saw your lover. Crikey. And she said, if you ever drop your handkerchief near my house, you'd be welcome to come and I'll pick it up and we can hang out. Sexy. Wow. 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 Yeah. yeah. But they, it was very jokey, by either. the way. They didn't actually fancy each other. She okay. Oh. sort of disliked him. Oh, wow. <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> this is a roller coaster that you've sent us on, Anna. So many mixed signals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was Pride and Prejudice. They started off not liking each other. She thought he was a, probably a fusty, sexist old man. She said he had the mind of a disgustingly precocious child of two. And then they gradually warmed to each other over the course of their 40-year romance. <laughs> and what was the thing about if he drops his handkerchief? Is that so she can look at his bum or what? Is that... Uh, oh. So she can look at his bum? Well, if you drop your handkerchief, yeah. he has to bend over to pick it up. Mate, I didn't get that, but now you've said that, I think it is. Mm. Yes. It's normally the lady dropping the handkerchief, That's isn't what it? I Was she saying, if you, you old man, drop your handkerchief? I think from what I remember, that was the wording. She did like to invert gender norms sometimes, wow, sure. Virginia Woolf. So. He's in his 80s as well. That's a hell of a bend in your 80s. <laughs> Maybe that's why she's offering to pick it up for him. <laughs> oh, dear. Wow. Do you know what the standard dissection kit in America in the 19th century consisted of. Knife. Yep. Knife. Um, fork. You've got the knife. <laughs> yeah. Oh, forceps. I'll give you that. Yeah, fork, forceps. Sounds meant, similar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll like tell a, you. A saw. A saw bar Ooh, set kind of thing. I bet it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there were scissors. Scissors because they're very useful for, you know, cutting through bits yeah. of stuff. Um, there were some hooks. There were some scalpels. And there was a blowpipe. Oh, dear. Oh, hmm. yeah. A blowpipe it, is just a, a pipe, isn't it, really? Like yeah. a pipe. Blow in. Was it? Oh, oh. No, it's not It's not just a pipe. It's, it's pipe specifically designed to be blown into. I got it. You wouldn't just blow into any old pipe. Can I guess a theory? <laughs> yeah, go was on. Was it a pipe that was um, used for people's bum bums to make sure they weren't dead? You know the thing where you blow into it in order to... So it was just Very to good. make sure Can that I? your patient was actually dead. Can I make a guess? Mm. Uh, that, yes, that might I'm... be right, what Dan said, but I was just thinking maybe a, we already know that a large portion of um, bodies that were dissected were dolphins. So did they put it in the blow <laughs> hole, the blow pipe? Very clever, yes. I retract my suggestion and I put all my money on James's. <laughs> I'll take Dan's wow. suggestion. I'll <laughs> claim you. Anna, it's just as well you did. It was for the colon. Oh. It wasn't to test whether or not people were dead. By the time they were on the slab, they generally were dead. But it was to make the colon easier to see what, like during a dissection. It? To inflate it. Yeah, oh, exactly. Nice. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it was for, it was sure for the bottom. Make sure you blow suck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it had a very strict instruction on the pipe written. I'm probably also <laughs> this side for blowing, yeah. this yes. side for placing into the anus. <laughs> Ultrasound with animals can be quite difficult. Um, I saw um, there was in London Zoo they tried to do ultrasound on an acarpi, and they had a real problem with that. Can you can you guess what the problem was with the acarpi ultrasound? Can, can you describe an acarpi again? I can't quite. It's like deer. a deer. Uh, oh, okay. oh, oh, so that means it might have antlers. 
uh, or carpies. I don't really. think have antlers. Okay. Uh, it's a bit bigger. Than, it's like a mixture between a deer and a zebra, I would say, in our carpy. Um, has it got a lot of confusing orifices on its body and they didn't know where to shove the... You oh, tend not to shove... Well, I might get to shoving things in a minute, but with ultrasound, the whole point of it is it's on the outside. You're absolutely right. I was thinking of an endoscopy, and I don't know why, because it's my fact, and it's about an ultrasound, <laughs> so forget that. Um, I'll is tell it, you. Oh, it's oh, oh, it's, it's so on. well camouflaged that you can't see where it is to do the ultrasound, because they're prey animals. <laughs> it's No, it's Damn. not that. It's uh, When you have an ultrasound, you have to put this gel on, um, which kind of helps the sound waves to come through. And El Carpies really love licking it off. <laughs> <laughs> so they really like the taste of it if you put it on there. Uh, there. If you're a rhino and you want to look at the reproductive tracts of a rhino, they're so full of fat that um, ultrasound doesn't really work, but you can do it by going up the bum. So that is kind of where you were coming from, Andy. I think that's what you were thinking of. That certainly is where okay. I was coming from. Yeah. <laughs> also, that's a massive machine. Are you going into one of those machines? Because... You can't build one of those for a rhino. What an ultrasound! Yeah. An ultrasound isn't is just like you're but, firing some um, sound waves into the body. You're right. It's not like an I'm MRI. You're MRI. MRI. Yeah. Oh, you don't want to put a rhino in an okay. MRI. You're right. <laughs> what we've ascertained is very few of us know the difference between an ultrasound, an MRI, an endoscopy. <laughs> Thank God we're not doctors. Thank God we're doing a relatively harmless job. They are amazing trunks because there's no bone in them. There's a hell of a lot of muscles. They've got way more muscles in their trunk than we have as humans in our entire body. And it's it's just so weird because it doesn't show up on fossil records as a result. Mm-hmm. And I just wonder how many animals in history that we have the oh, fossil yeah. records of actually have, an have amazing appendage. A big floppy trunk somewhere. Every single yeah. dinosaur could have a trunk. Yeah. T Rex yeah. might have had a massive snozzer right at the end. Actually, and other like muscly appendages all over their bodies, right? They yes. Might have done. <laughs> might have, yeah. Everything looked like a huge octopus in the olden days, but <laughs> we've just got no record of the tentacles. They did one experiment where um, participants were asked to take part in an ice cream tasting test, which, I mean, what a great. That's great study to take part in hmm. and they were asked to take part with someone else and that someone else would either be someone without a visible social stigma or someone with one and the social stigma that they would have is they were either obese or they had a scar on their face a disfiguring scar on their face and the person who was asked to do the study with them the ice cream tasting test if the person without the social stigma ate shed loads of ice cream or hardly any then they'd copy them but if it was the obese person or the person with the scar doing it, then they wouldn't copy them. So they overcame that because I guess the idea is that you don't want to mimic someone who is has negative associations. I can in your see culture. that with the ice cream. Like if you see an if the person saw an obese person eating an ice cream and had this yeah. kind of idea that obesity was wrong, then wouldn't want to be like that. But the scar is really interesting. I would have thought that you wouldn't copy them if they were running with scissors, for instance. Uh, if, it, yeah. if, it, if it's a scar often denotes uh, perhaps being a pirate or um, or it? maybe a gangster and if a gangster was eating lots of ice cream and looking threatening at me I would eat lots of ice cream too would you? Yeah. I wouldn't risk it in case he wanted mine as well, he obviously liked ice cream <laughs> <laughs> but also interesting that what mimics people a lot parrots, where do parrots live on the shoulders of pirates what do pirates have, scars this is falling apart, this theory, Anna. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, this has gone pretty loose. <laughs> you guys may remember the EU's Wine Lake and Butter Mountain, but I don't yeah. know if all our listeners will. Do you guys remember this? Not really, so no. this is the idea that um, the EU creates too much of a certain product and they kind of store it so that the price doesn't go too low. Exactly, yeah. So there was a period where the EU countries in total were collectively producing... 1.7 billion extra bottles of wine each year, which feels like an enormous overshoot to me. And they paid farmers to turn it into ethanol. So you would go through the whole process of turning grapes into wine, and then they would just convert it back into undrinkable pure alcohol. But they were incentivized to do so. Wow. Um, and, and the Butter uh, Mountain was similar, yeah. What did they use the alcohol for, like industrial stuff, I guess? Yeah, I, it, can, it can be used as a fuel, can't it? Ethanol and... Um... And the butter thing, they just made a massive sort of slip slide. <laughs> <laughs> All the and way I... down the Eiger. Yeah. 
There um, was uh, a beef mountain too, which is the un- unknown third uh, element of the EU food surplus beef pyramid. Beef mountain I would say. sounds disgusting. Mm. Welcome to Beef Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Andy's theme park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not queuing up for that. There's a big sausage swing boat. Um, <laughs> that's one of the rides. Um, I was listening to a really great podcast about this whole history of the Shang Dynasty. It was called Chinese History Podcast, and it was really interesting. There was a, a bit where the host of it put into context when this period was in time, this supposed mythological um, dynasty, and it's 1600 BC to 1046 BC was the rough period. So in that time, Tutankhamun and Nefertiti were over in Egypt. They were living. The Trojan War was happening. Moses. Andy, stop. It's not funny. Is it because I said it's it's funny? It's funny. funny. It's funny. I'm not smiling. I'm not laughing. That is funny. I I accidentally said titty, didn't I? You did, yeah, Dan. And we didn't hear anything else after that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I was reading about Mary Beard, the academic. Oh, yeah. Um, who died in 1956, I think, or 58. Well, not uh, not, not is... our Mary Beard. No, no, no. This is <laughs> Mary Ritter stricken. Beard. <laughs> yeah, I know. My heart stopped. And then Imagine I just thought, what? She, she'd been a ghost all this time. She's got so many great documentaries <laughs> made because she was there. That's why she, that's why she knows so much yeah. about history. Well, Mary Ritter um, married Charles Austin Beard in 1900, uh, and they were a really amazing couple of uh, intellectuals. Um, and Mary Ritter Beard um, wrote a load of articles, uh, one of which was a study of the Encyclopedia Britannica to see how many women were in the Encyclopedia oh. Britannica. And basically, the answer was not many. Um, she said she questioned in the article why there was no article on Queen, even though there was an article on Kings mm. in the mm. Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, she said that there were no women included in the uh, article on health and medicine. She said, according to the article on songs, no women sang in Europe, um, basically in history. And the contributions of nuns, choir compositions and singing from women is not recognised at all. Wow. And so she had a right go at the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, and I thought I'd check if she was in Britannica today. And her husband is, and she is oh, not, not as far as I can see. Um, she's mentioned in the article on women's history. Uh, this is the online one. I'm not in the office, so I can't check the actual. You've got them oh, behind yeah. your head at the moment, Andy, so <laughs> right. we could check them. But yeah, as far as I can see, she's not in Britannica at the moment. Wow. Wow. So let's get her Mary in. Beard. Yes. Yeah. Mary Beard. That's great. I mean, that's not great that um, she's not in, but that's great. That's um, <laughs> oh, the story you told. The story you told is great. Um, wow. Shall I just see if she's in uh, quickly? Yeah, so yeah. she Charles Austin Beard, I think, is in. Uh, he's in the online version for sure. But, but they'll, both be under, they'll both be under B. If she died in 56, yeah. they're not going to be... What, what year is that? But Andy's got... This yeah, you've got three published editions. Published way later than 1956. This is the new Encyclopedia oh, okay. Britannica. Not the old one. Mm. Founded 1768. Yeah, 1991. Fine. Right, Beard. I'm more bittersweet. <laughs> Bible. Beryllium. Berlin Wall. This is a great podcast. This is such good content. <laughs> reading out. Andy reads the Encyclopedia Britannica, but only the oh, titles. Oh, my word. Beard. Charles Austin. Yes. Yeah. Then, next article is on Beard Lichen. She's not there. Oh, no. it's a disgrace. Not like in Mary. <laughs> <laughs> um, I read an article about the origins of golf. This was in the SBM magazine, but they spoke to um, like proper historians from Scotland um, because that's where people think it began. And the idea is there's a bit of land in between the sea and the bit you can farm, um, which is called the lynx because it links the two bits together. And you would kind of keep sheep there or you keep rabbits there or stuff like that, keep animals, um, but it's quite a boring job and so people would start hitting balls around. And what this article said, and I haven't checked it yet, but it was well sourced, is that the bunkers, you know, there's like the sand traps that you get on a golf course. Mm -hmm. They Mm -hmm. were formed by sheep who would hide behind little hillocks because the wind was so bad in that part of Scotland and they would kind of lie down and over years and years and years they would make deeper and deeper holes which would get filled with sand. No! And he said that the first greens, so the greens where you're putting are really flat uh, and they're easy to just hit the ball along the ground, reckons they could have been rabbit warrens because a rabbit warren would be, the rabbit would put a hole in the ground for it to go into and then it would flatten around the area around the warren with its feet to make it flat and he reckons that that's how those might have started. Wow. Sheep and rabbits gave us golf. 
That's amazing. amazing. And who designed the golf clubs? Was that the Badgers or? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the Beavers, right? Who were making the dams and they just yes. had spare bits of wood. There we maybe. go. Of course. That's, I mean, that's, do you, do you hold well, to that, James? I don't believe it at all, <laughs> but it was really well sourced. And sometimes when things are unbelievable, but they're said by people who have authority, you kind of have to believe them a little bit. Absolutely. Plus that's making a really good Disney film. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's um, quite a boring Disney film if the length of time that James is describing has to take place. <laughs> you know, you I think a, mon- a, a montage will be enough. It's though. just yeah, sheep yeah, laying down yeah. for a very long time. <laughs> I don't know if you watch that for like, okay, you have to watch that for a hundred years, but at the end of the movie, you get a game of golf. That's exciting, isn't no, it? No, you're that right. That'll really perk things up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, One thing more boring than watching a sheep lie down for a hundred years. <laughs> Oh shit! There's a game of golf. Yeah, <laughs> um, do you know the fastest eating mammal uh, alive? Is it? I thought it was the star-nosed mole. Star-nosed it mole. Is. We did it. Yeah. So uh, Anna, we, oh, we? we did this it, last uh, week. Can't it, um, can't it observe and um, swallow a piece of prey in something like 120 milliseconds? Yeah, yeah, something like that. And that's even quicker than a human can react to a red light. I, I, oh, yes, yeah, so that's about it? 670 milliseconds. Off the top yeah, of my head, yeah. So, top of the head, top of the head. Yeah. Isn't yeah. If you will um, insist on recording episodes when I'm not there, then this is going to happen. <laughs> Isn't the organ on the front of a Stardust Mole's face um, 12 times more... Um, what was it? Sensitive. Sensitive. Sensitive than a clitoris. I Isn't believe it? so. I believe and so. it's right. easier to find. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I'll tell you what, since we recorded last week, I've tested that out and it's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, we did that last week. Right. Sorry. Well, Anna. I'm going back on holiday then. Don't worry about it. <laughs> a giraffe would be a good thing to hang in a tree because you can sort of flop the neck over on one side. And it's quite convenient. It's like its own it's, coat hanger. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, you could eat it from either side. So you know that lady in the tramp spaghetti scene. Imagine two of them <laughs> yes. gnawing their way up to a kiss. <laughs> the leopards and the giraffe. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't want to be the one that ends up with just that scrawny neck, and the other one gets the four legs and a body. Yeah. I guess maybe it's a race to the body. It's a closer race on the leg side, isn't it? (laughs) There's not much meat on those legs, is there? No. Although I don't, I think the legs are longer than the neck, actually. And you've got to get through. Oh, in a giraffe. Really? Come on. Yeah, I reckon. Legs are longer than the neck. I can't imagine things very well, but surely a giraffe, it's famous for having a long neck. But but it's like there's there's four legs, so if you stack the legs up on top of each other, they probably exceed the length. I don't mean the legs stacked. You mean a single leg is is longer than a giraffe (laughs) neck? Okay, I I never, never, ever Google in this podcast, but I'm going to do it now, what a giraffe looks like. The re- only reason they're famous for the neck thing is because other animals don't have the long neck, guys. Other animals cool. have the long legs, so we don't go on about it. Sorry, who here is voting that the neck Me. is longer? Because I am. I'm it's saying pr- front front legs longer. It's pretty Back close, actually. It. Is it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not willing. Yes. I'm looking at Google Images, and I'm not willing to make a call on it. <laughs> oh, my God. No, yeah. Okay, interesting. I'm looking at an illustration, sure. And then there's a bouncy castle one next to it, which has much shorter legs. Guys, they're the same length. The average legs are six feet long. The average neck is six feet long. Sorry, that... I went to actual facts rather than pictures. I know what that's not co- how we're supposed to do things. What a coincidence, though, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? That your legs are the same. Imagine, would you rather have a neck that was the same length as your legs or legs that were the same length as your neck? <laughs> Easy Ooh. answer for a giraffe is what we're saying, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> They've got it just right. Wow. Oh, that's nice. So nobody wins and nobody loses. What a happy ending. What about the tail? <laughs> 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 Okay, that's it. That's all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to get in contact with me, you can go onto Twitter and you can message me at James Harkin. If you'd like to speak to Andrew, you can go to his Twitter, which is at Andrew Hunter M. Dan Schreiber is also on Twitter. His Twitter handle is at Schreiberland. And Anna Tashinsky is still not on Twitter, but you can get in touch with her by going to your email server and putting in the address podcast at qi.com if you have something more general to say you can go to the group twitter account which is at no such thing and if you would like to learn anything else about us you can go to no such thing as a fish.com 
And that is also the place where you can get tickets to come and see us live on our massive tour. It's going to be really, really exciting. It's going to be a first half, which we have not yet written, so God knows what it'll be, but it'll be definitely a load of fun with loads of facts and loads of silliness. In the last tour, I sang Baby Shark for anyone who wasn't there. Uh, I definitely won't be doing that this time. (laughs) But the second half will be a normal podcast, but it'll be the full unedited version, so you'll get all of these kind of silly bits that you heard in today's compilation you will hear them live and for real and probably a lot of things that will never ever 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 make it to air so if you want tickets for that then go to no such things fish.com or you can actually go to qi.com slash fish events it'll take you to the very same place we will be back well rather they will be back with a very special guest next week and we as a group will continue making these podcasts every single week as we have done for the last 380 weeks and as we will continue to do so until they don't let us do it anymore we'll see you soon goodbye